morning and uh, for those of you who are here and online, welcome to this afternoon's seminar on enterprise agreements. Uh, this is uh, the firm's second session as a part of its navigating the challenges for SMEs, a roadmap to success seminar series. By way of introduction, um, going to obviously talk about enterprise agreements, I will touch upon the history of such agreements, including some current things and developments that we've seen over a number of years. Um, and the reason for that, that links into the proposed changes or the changes that the Federal Labor Government has now made to Fair Work. Um, one of those is the great uh, use of multi employer uh, agreements, uh, other changes such as those made to the Federal Operable Test and changes to the approval process uh, under these reforms. So, if I touch upon the uh, history, uh, as many of you would know, uh, Australia had a centralised system of wage setting through industrial instruments known as awards. Uh, Labor and capital would negotiate wages and other benefits for employees on an industry basis. Uh, a federal state court uh, would assist with conciliation of the neg negotiations and then if this was not successful, had the power to arbitrate, ultimately making awards. Gradual moves away from this form of centralised system began in the late 1980s. Australia first introduced enterprise bargaining in 1991, when the Commission adopted principles of enterprise bargaining, which facilitated more flexible arrangements at the workplace level. In 1993, the Federal Labor Government introduced enterprise agreements into the Federal Industrial Relations System for the first time. An enterprise agreement is a collective agreement made at an enterprise level directly between an employer and their workforce about terms and conditions of employment. Enterprise bargaining carries the expectation that labour and capital should work together at the workplace or enterprise level to agree on conditions of employment. The more decentralised system heralded by enterprise bargaining created greater potential for wages and conditions to match the individual circumstances of the workplace. Initially, enterprise agreements and bargaining flourished, with employers and their workforce achieving productivity and wages gains through bespoke arrangements that suited their workplace. A key benefit for the employer was that an enterprise agreement brought industrial peace. That is, that it was unlawful for its workforce to take industrial action during the life of the agreement. Perhaps with the decline in the level of industrial disputation, this has become less of a benefit over time. Well, recently, employers seem to be keen to use their enterprise agreements to achieve other benefits, such as all in rates of pay or annualised salaries through administrative convenience that are not always readily available under awards. Larger employers are also looking to an enterprise agreement as a means of having one industrial instrument to their enterprise rather than multiple boards, which is possible under the current environment. Things changed in 1996, uh, where we had the introduction of individual industrial instruments for the first time, known as Australian Workplace Agreements. So we moved away from enterprise bargaining at the workplace towards individual arrangements. That changed uh, in 2009, the introduction for the first time of the Fair Work Era, which reinstated the primacy of enterprise bargaining and enterprise agreements. The aim that was introduced into the Fair Work laws at that time, which still interestingly enough exists, was uh, achieving productivity and fairness through an emphasis on enterprise level collective bargaining, underpinned by simple good faith bargaining obligations and clear rules governing industrial action, a point I will come back to later. 
Fair Work provides for three different types of enterprise agreements, a single enterprise agreement, multi-employer agreements, and a Greenfields agreement. In the last decade, only two of these types of agreements, the single enterprise agreement and Greenfields agreement, have been used in a significant way. A single enterprise agreement, as the name suggests, is normally functional between one employer and its workers. And this is the most common form of agreement. The key feature of a Greenfields agreement is that they are formed when a new enterprise has been created and there are no current employees with which to negotiate both agreement. Greenfields agreement is between an employer and the union. In terms of some of the current developments and trends in relation to enterprise agreements, a key trend is the decrease in the number of new enterprise agreements. Uh, enterprise agreements are therefore not having an impact on either productivity or the wages. Um, and I'll discuss the reasons why I think that is occurring in a moment. In terms of the decrease in the overall numbers of enterprise agreements, since enterprise agreements were introduced, there was a steady uptake over a nearly 20 year period from December 1991 to a peak of just over 25,000 agreements in December 2010. From that 2010 peak, the number of enterprise agreements has plummeted to less than 10,000 in the September quarter 2020. By June 2022, the number had risen slightly to just over 11,000, though this remains well below half of the peak from December 2010. The number of employees covered by current enterprise agreements has correspondingly decreased over this period, peaking at 2.6 million in the March quarter 2014, before falling to just over 1.7 million in June 2022. Clearly, these numbers indicate that enterprise agreements are not being used as a means to achieve workplace goals of either productivity or wage growth. What then are some of the reasons for this drop off in terms of enterprise bargaining agreements? Commentators have long debated the reasons for this significant reduction in enterprise agreements and the corresponding decline of the number of employees covered by such agreements. Some have suggested that the more simplified award system since the modern awards commenced in 2010 is a likely reason for the reduction in the number of enterprise agreements. I must say I share that view, but there are some other reasons. The continued decline in the number of union members in the private sector, the difficulties associated with forcing an employer to bargain for an enterprise agreement, and the complexity of the enterprise bargaining process, including the approval process. Labor's response to this, through its reforms, seeks to address some of these reasons why we haven't seen bargaining enterprise agreement getting approved in the same numbers that we had in the past. It makes changes to enterprise bargaining, making it easier for unions to initiate such bargaining, and removal of employer options during enterprise bargaining, such as making it harder to terminate old enterprise agreements, changes to multi-business bargaining, and changes to the approval process of enterprise agreements to address concerns about the complexity of this process. In terms of the enterprise agreement market, this is where some significant changes have been made under the reforms. Historically, Fair Work has not contained provisions that have made it easier for a workforce and their union to compel an employer to bargain for an enterprise agreement. The bargaining may be commenced by an employer, and they do this of their own initiative, or under pressure from their workforce and their union. 
In circumstances, though, where an employer refused to negotiate for an enterprise agreement, the options are not straightforward. In this situation, a union supported by the workforce may make an application to the Commission and, in doing so, may seek what is described as a majority support determination. This is something that the Commission can make if it's satisfied of various criteria, in particular, that the majority of employees who would be covered by the agreement want to bargain for such an agreement. In reality, there have been very few MSD applications that have been made since Fair Work. And what Labor has sought to do through these reforms is to increase the ability for unions and the workforce to initiate bargaining. Reforms seek to make it easier through various different ways. Changes to bargaining for replacement enterprise agreements, changes to bargaining for multi employer enterprise agreements, and the potential for bargaining in relation to zombie enterprise agreements, each of which I will discuss. In terms of the first one, that is a replacement enterprise agreement. The reality of what's happened over time is that a lot of employers have had an agreement that reaches its normal expiry date and have decided there's no great benefit in negotiating for a replacement enterprise agreement and have simply relied on that agreement to continue to apply to their workforce. Um, a key element of the reforms is that there is no need for a NERR to issue to commence bargaining for a replacement enterprise agreement, which has what been one of the stumbling blocks for the initiation of a negotiation for a replacement agreement. A replacement agreement uh, that is one that has a normal expiry date within the last five years and covers a substantially similar scope of employees uh, as to which the negotiations are about to commence. In this case, bargaining may commence on a written request from a union. That's it. Just simply a written request, and that is enough for bargaining to commence in relation to a replacement agreement. Now, that's a significant change that one could anticipate would lead to a greater level of negotiations in relation to replacement agreements. Um, this reform under the Secure Jobs better pay reforms removes a, an easy opportunity for an employer to resist bargaining in relation to an expired enterprise agreement. Secondly, and, and probably what's been most talked about in the media has been the changes to bargaining for what's been described as multi-employer enterprise agreements. This is a key element of the reforms, and it will enable employers and their workforce to bargain for single interest multi employer enterprise agreements. Previously, it was necessary for employers to be engaged in a joint venture or common enterprise in order for the multi employer enterprise agreement to be an option. The reforms expand this to include employers with a common interest. The way in which it works is that a multi-employer enterprise agreement is unable to be made unless a single interest employer authorisation is in place. The Commission is empowered to make one of these authorisations. Interestingly, and again, in order to encourage bargaining, a union may apply for an authorisation in relation to a particular employer. In this manner, a union may force an employer to commence bargaining for a multi-employer enterprise agreement with other employers, which in practice is an industry-based industrial instrument in much the same way as an award. In terms of the criteria for granting a single interest employer authorisation, the Commission must make such an authorisation 
if it satisfied the various criteria. The first of those is that at least some of the employees will be covered by the proposed agreement are represented by a union. The secondly is that the employers have a common interest and then there are various criteria which refer to what is a common interest. They include that the employer have clearly identifiable common interests with other employers that are part of the application and that the employer's operations of business activities are reasonably comparable. The third criteria is that the employers and the union have had the opportunity to express their views uh, and the workforce. And there are some other additional requirements which I will discuss in a moment. In terms of the common interests, the Act sets out what those common interests might include. Include, and it refers to geographical location, regulatory regime, and the nature of the business. Um, interestingly, there is also a presumption under the legislation that if a union has applied for an author authorization and the employer employs more than 50 employees at the time the application is made, it is presumed that the employer has clearly identifiable common interests and that their operations are reasonably comparable with the other employers that will be covered by the multi-employer agreement, unless otherwise proved. So if you are a larger employer, you must rebut that presumption, which you might suggest won't be necessarily an easy exercise. In terms of the other additional requirements referred to a moment ago, if a union makes the application, the Commission must also be satisfied in relation to each employer that they have at least 20 employees. So small businesses are not covered by this regime. A majority of the employers, employees who will be covered by the agreement want to bargain for the agreement. And the employer and the workforce that will be covered by the agreement are not covered by an enterprise agreement already. Um, there are also some exclusions from this process. The Commission has the discretion to exclude an employer in certain circumstances where they are bargaining in good faith for a proposed enterprise agreement that will cover the workforce. So if you're already engaged in a bargaining process for a single enterprise agreement, that gets you potentially off the hook. The employers of the workforce have a history of effectively bargaining in relation to enterprise agreements. and on the day the Commission makes the authorisation, less than nine months have passed since the most recent nominally expiry date of such an agreement. So if you satisfy those criteria, the Commission does have the discretion to exclude you. There are also some other restrictions on making an authorisation. The Commission cannot make one if the proposed agreement relates to a workforce in relation to general building construction. So the CFMEU is still not allowed to be involved in this process. In terms of the effect of a single interest employer authorisation, um, an employer who's then subject to one of these authorisations needs to comply with the usual enterprise bargaining rules, which of course include good faith bargaining obligations under fair work. The Commission is also authorised to assist parties during bargaining to reach an agreement that meets their needs. In this manner, a union may force an employer to commence bargaining for a multi-employer enterprise agreement, which is in practice, as has been described, an industry-based industrial instrument. The um, other uh, comment to make about these reforms is that um, what has occurred is that Labor's also taken away some of the tools that employers have used during the bargaining process. Um, one of the tools that has been used has been applications to terminate uh, enterprise bargaining arrangements. Um, and this has been used as an effective tool by employers during bargaining, uh, which either as a threat, making the application or actually going through with the threat by having 
the agreement terminated. It's obviously an agreement that's passed, it's not an expiry date, and the effect of that is you fall back to the award. So a number of employers have used this as a bargaining tactic. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the reasons for that, uh, it is for the reason that the workforce then falls back to the modern award. And in this situation, the workforce may stand for its benefits won during the course of negotiations of past enterprise agreements. In terms of uh, how you historically able to terminate after the normal expiry date, um, the Commission does have the power to terminate. Um, that was found in section 226 of the Act, and the Commission was required to terminate in certain circumstances. The Commission had to be satisfied that it was not contrary to the public interest, and that it considered that it was appropriate, taking into account the views and circumstances of not only the employer, but the workforce and the union. And it was necessary to consider the circumstances of each of those, including the effect of termination, uh, before the Commission granted the application to terminate an agreement. Um, whilst Fair Work imposed an obligation on the Commission to terminate an agreement, the references to public interest and to whether it was appropriate to terminate the enterprise agreement gave rise to discretionary judgment and gave the Commission scope to consider merit arguments as to whether the enterprise agreement should be terminated. Historically, therefore, the Commission was reluctant to terminate enterprise agreements, even after the normally expiry date passed, and especially uh, if the application was made during the course of bargaining for a new agreement. In 2015, an important decision in the matter of Horizon uh, was handed down, which marked a different approach to the termination of enterprise agreements. The Commission in this decision terminated a suite of enterprise agreements that applied to rail operator Horizon. At the time, Horizon was a freight company with operations predominantly in Northern Australia that had recently been privatised by the Queensland Government. The main factors for the Commission's willingness on this occasion to terminate the enterprise agreements were the following. Horizon was operating in a very competitive environment and its business was significantly uncompetitive and performing poorly. Horizon was able to demonstrate that one of the significant reasons for this was the restrictive arrangements in its enterprise agreements. The parties had been bargaining for a significant period of time and Horizon was prepared to give a series of undertakings to maintain certain payments under those agreements which were to be terminated by the Commission. The full bench rejected an argument from the Union that the Commission should not terminate during bargaining, indicating that there is nothing in the objects of fair work that would suggest that the emphasis on promoting productivity is primarily to be achieved through bargaining in good faith, rather than by other means such as termination of enterprise agreement that has passed its normal expiry date. So there again, the full bench is referring to that objective in relation to the primacy to be given to enterprise bargaining agreements. The Horizon decision which signalled a change in the approach towards the termination of enterprise agreements resulted in a number of employers making applications to terminate their enterprise agreements, many of which were successful, where bargaining was protracted and the anti-competitive terms were contained in their agreements. The secure jobs, better pay reforms changes this, requiring the Commission to instead be satisfied of one of the following before terminating an existing enterprise agreement, even when it's past its normal expiry date. The continued operation of the agreement would be unfair to the employees it covers, the agreement does not and is not likely to cover any employees. The continued operation of the agreement would pose a significant threat to the viability of the business, or the employer gives a guarantee that it will preserve termination entitlements under the agreement. Now, in relation to those criteria, it's quite clear that the reforms now require the Commission to only terminate the agreement 
if one of the above criteria is met and if they are satisfied that it's appropriate in all the circumstances to terminate the agreement. In short, the new criteria mean that the Commission must uh, consider, must, it makes it much more difficult for the Commission to grant an application by an employer to terminate an agreement, taking away this sword that was used as an industrial tactic in the course of negotiations for a new enterprise agreement. I turn now to the uh, issue of uh, zombie agreements. Um, an aspect of the secure jobs better pay reforms is a sunset date of the end of the year for industrial instruments approved prior to commencement of fair work laws, uh, at which time these old industrial instruments will be be terminated. The union movement has long campaigned for a sunset date for these industrial instruments, uh, many of which were made during the work choices era, but are now all older than a decade. Earlier, the Labor government under Prime Minister Rudd had resisted this pressure to include a sunset date for these industrial instruments when uh, he enacted the fair work laws. The uh, current government's introduction of sunset date for these industrial instruments, referred to as zombie agreements, removes one of the last vestiges of work choices. Um, an ability has been provided under the reforms to extend the operation of zombie agreements uh, in certain limited circumstances. Uh, in addition to that, uh, employers need to provide certain information to their workforce who are covered by these zombie agreements before the 7th of June 2023. Uh, in terms of finding out whether you've got a zombie agreement, it should be a straightforward exercise, but it's not. Um, many employers who, who do have zombie agreements may not be aware that they have such an agreement. And, and the reason for this is that many of these agreements are Australian workplace agreements which were approved by the Commission. So there's not an easy list of those agreements. Uh, and you need to check your employee records to see whether or not you have any of those types of agreements. Uh, other types of agreements which are collective and have been approved by the Commission uh, are available uh, by looking at the Commission's website and they've produced a list of such agreements for guidance to employers. Um, in terms of uh, the obligations uh, that are now imposed upon employers in relation to such agreements, there is a notification requirement. As I mentioned, uh, information needs to be provided before the 7th of June to those who are covered by such agreements. That written notice from the employer to those covered uh, must identify to the employee that they're covered by such a zombie agreement that the zombie agreement shall terminate at the end of the year um, and uh, what the employer intends to do uh, in relation to such a zombie agreement. Now, the, the effect of that is likely to be that uh, it will encourage the workforce to consider negotiations uh, for a new agreement, having, been, having had it brought to their attention that their agreement is going to come to an end but they will fall back to the modern award unless a new agreement is negotiated. Um, and as I say, you would expect that to lead to some form of negotiation between the workforce uh, and their employer uh, in relation to negotiation of a new agreement. Um, in terms of uh, enterprise agreement types, I've indicated previously that there are now three types of enterprise agreements that are available as fair work. And that is the, the single enterprise agreement, the multi-employer agreement, uh, and also a Greenfields agreement. The uh, single agreement is, is the most common. Uh, that's the one in which employers have been using to negotiate directly with their workforce uh, in the past. Uh, and as I've said, the Greenfields one is really for a, a, a new operation. In terms of the uh, multi-employer uh, agreements, uh, which are the uh, agreements that have had a fair bit of 
publicity in relation to these reforms. The reforms make some significant changes to this particular stream. Um, I've mentioned that previously it was necessary under this stream for the employers to be either in a joint venture or a common in enterprise list to apply, but that option has now been expanded to the common interest. Um, in terms of uh, the multi-employer agreement, once there is a multi-employer multi agreement in place, um, a union can apply to the Commission to rope in employers to that agreement. So if you, ima if you imagine for a moment that um, the, uh, we have a situation in the future that there is a multi-employer agreement, say the hospitality industry, uh, the relevant union is a party to that, and there might be two or three employers who are party to that agreement uh, at, say, a statewide level here in South Australia. Um, what, the, what the union can then do is it can apply to rope in other employers in that same industry who have got common interests into that multi-employer agreement. And in that situation, the Commission shall grant the application where a majority of the workforce wishes to be covered by the multi-employer agreement. Any existing enterprise agreement has passed its normal expiry date and other criteria met, including that the employer has a common interest that are applicable to a single interest employer authorisation, and the same exemptions that are applicable to a single employer authorisation also apply. So effectively, what you're doing for the roping in application is you're using basically the same criteria you do for the authorisation, which is the start of the bargaining process. So once you've got the agreement up and running, you can then apply in much similar way to then seek to rope in the employers to this uh, multi-employer agreement. Now, um, in terms of union strategy, um, I mentioned uh, earlier the objectives of the Act. There was a, a significant decision um, in a slightly different context. Uh, it was in the context of some industrial action that was going on um, involving a company called Spitzer. Uh, and they operate tugboats. And there was some significant industrial action going on late last year, following several years of unsuccessful bargaining negotiations with the union, the uh, CFMEU. <clears throat> it got to the point where there were some applications made uh, to the Commission, which were the, the Commission was considering uh, before these reforms were introduced. One of the applications made was a order to terminate the industrial action that was taking place. That application was made by the union. Um, the significance of granting the order would have been that the Commission would have then arbitrated the bargaining dispute, potentially imposing, if you like, an enterprise agreement on the parties. The decision of the full bench, which included uh, Vice President Hatcher, who of course has since become the president of the commission, was that um, despite the ongoing disputation that had been occurring, the fact that bargaining had been going on for, for several years, I believe it was up to three years, they would not grant the termination order that was sought by the union. A decision was made instead by the commission to suspend the bargaining, sorry, suspend the industrial action to enable bargaining to continue for a further period between the parties of up to six months. What was interesting about um, the rationale for that decision was that um, in the context of discussing why they didn't grant a termination order, which would have led, led to arbitration in relation to the bargaining dispute, um, they said the following. The significance of this consideration that is not to grant a termination order, arises from that part of the object of the Fair Work Act in Section 3F, which refers to achieving productivity and fairness through an emphasis on enterprise level collective bargaining, underpinned by simple good faith bargaining obligations and clear rules governing government action. Now, 
the significance of that is that what that Vice President Hatcher and the other members of the full bench are referring to is the privacy given to enterprise level collective bargaining, which is something different to multi employer bargaining. Interestingly, through these reforms, those objectives of the Act have not actually been changed. Uh, objectives have been introduced, as many of you would know, to promote job security and to ensure gender equality. But the objectives in relation to enterprise bargaining and enterprise agreements have not been altered. So, as to the relevance of that in relation to uh, multi employer agreements, um, it seems to me it's going to be difficult for the unions in that context to force a situation where they're able to get orders which deal with an intractable industrial dispute and actually get orders where the Commission is going to feel comfortable imposing terms in an enterprise agreement upon parties because the objective remains the same. What I think is more likely to happen is that unions will seek to agree multi-employer enterprise agreements with several friendly employers. And they only need two or three to achieve this objective. I suspect what they will do with the first round of these multi-employer enterprise agreements is look at content which has some issues such as prohibition of labour hire and similar other issues, which seems to me to be consistent with the objective in relation to the promotion of job security, which is now included in the Act. Consultation with union and some other, but what they will do is that they will only have modest wage rates slightly above the relevant on the board. Then um, they will seek to locate other employers to these multi-employer enterprise agreements. Um, again, you're using the same criteria, but it avoids all this bargaining and negotiations and all this other stuff that goes on to get them in the first place. Instead of that, it seems to me if you've got friendly employers on side, you can get that agreement up and then you can seek to join other employers along the journey. Then for your next enterprise agreement, then that is probably where the fun is going to commence. And my suspicion is it's at that point that the unions will really look at seeking to ramp home their advantage of having what I'd call an industry-wide multi-employer agreement and seeking significant increases under that particular agreement through that process at that stage. But I don't think they're going to do that before that time. My suspicion is they're going to adopt a strategy like that. And that's certainly the strategy we are currently seeing amongst our employer group um, as, as these uh, changes are about to commence uh, early next month. Um, there were also some uh, other changes that were made in relation to the enterprise agreements approval process. Um, one of the criticisms of the reduction in numbers of enterprise agreements and also the numbers of employees covered by such agreements has been a criticism directed towards the Commission in terms of the enterprise agreement approval process. Um, to me, that's a bit of a finger pointing exercise. I'm, I'm not quite sure this is really a key reason. Um, but in any event, what the reforms seek to impose or seek to achieve is a more flexible approach to enterprise bargaining approval. Um, there's criticism in the explanatory memorandum around the fact that the Commission had been using rigid rules, uh, a rigid rules based approval process, and that what was sought to be introduced was a more flexible principles based approach. Um, the reforms require the Commission to issue a statement of principles in relation to its approval process, and the Commission has done that, uh, and that statement addishes, addresses a number of issues, including the notification of intention to bargain for an enterprise agreement, providing an opportunity for employees to consider a proposed enterprise agreement, the explanation of a proposed enterprise agreement, and providing a reasonable opportunity to vote on the proposed enterprise agreement. 
Um, I must say, to my mind, that statement of principles um, doesn't really change the approach in terms of what the Commission is indicating it's going to do um, in relation to the approval process. Um, and it still has some time frames within that statement of principles um, if you want to have a look at it. Um, so I'm not sure that's necessarily going to change a great deal. I think some of the other changes I'm about to discuss are, are, are more significant. Uh, one of those is uh, in relation to boot. Um, currently, an enterprise agreement passes the boot if the Commission is satisfied of the following that each award covered employee and each prospective award covered employee would be better off. <laughs> And as we, we know, a regular criticism of that is that it has been applied in an overly technical way, including on a line-by-line -line basis. Uh, the high watermark of this technical approach was the decision back in 2016 of Harp and, and Coles Supermarkets, um, and a, an issue that was scrutinised in that decision was the interaction between a flat rate of pay under an enterprise agreement and penalty rates payable under the relevant model. Um, Coles Enterprise Agreement contained a flat rate for permanent employees engaged to perform work under the agreement. But for permanent employees who enjoyed a high rate during the normal uh, weekdays, hours under the agreement appeared to be better off under the agreement. That, that is the full time ones. In contrast, Hart, who, who was an employee, brought the application along with other part-time employees who work mainly at nights on the weekend in two particular Queensland stores sought to demonstrate through an arthritic exercise that they would, based on their rosters, be worse off. And, and the Commission went through this line-by-line -line analysis looking at each individual employee and came to the conclusion that um, they weren't better off. Um, what the Commission then did is it gave Coles the opportunity, consistent with the current processes to give an undertaking to address the Commission's concerns. Um, Coles, who decided enough was enough by this stage, threw out their arms and said, look, this is all too hard. We're not going to give an undertaking. The agreement wasn't approved. And as a consequence of that, uh, Coles, in, the entire Coles workforce fell out of being covered by enterprise agreements. And that has certainly skewed the figures in relation to uh, who's covered by enterprise agreements. So. Um, Labor though has recognised that this is a this is a significant problem in terms of getting uh, enterprise agreements approved because it certainly put off a lot of employers past that point. So the reforms make changes to the boot to address these concerns. In particular, what the changes do is they require the Commission to undertake the boot as a global assessment, which is certainly the way in which employers have been looking at it for many decades. Instead of a line by line comparison, the matter applied by the full bench in Coles. The Commission also needs to apply the boot to reasonably foreseeable patterns or types of work under the agreement, reducing the risk of a hypothetical scenario bringing down the entire agreement, which again is a reference to the way in which Hart is talking about its possible rosters. Um, another significant change is that the Commission is now able to amend proposed agreements itself to amend or remove terms which don't meet the boot. Um, this is obviously a change welcomed by everybody, uh, which simplifies the boot. Um, and those changes will commence uh, next month. So in, re in relation to uh, a failure to meet the basic requirements to have your agreement approved, there is now going to be a position where there's no automatic rejection of the agreement. The Commission may approve the agreement with undertakings as it can at the moment. And under the Secure Jobs Better Pays reforms, what the Commission can now do is actually rectify the agreement. Um, in the old days, what you had to do is you had to start the whole process again, take the agreement back to the workforce, have the vote, and, and so forth, and then go through the approval process. Um, but certainly the rectification of the enterprise agreement, which is basically extracting out those terms that don't comply with the boot is a very effective way, in addition to the ability uh, to continue to provide undertakings of resolving any particular concerns the Commission might have as part of the approval process. And one would think 
is going to encourage employers to get together with their workforce and actually bargain, have enterprise agreements, knowing that if there are issues with it, they should be able to be addressed during the course of the approval process. Um, so that is my final point in relation to the reform. But I'm happy to open it up to any questions that people might have in relation to those reforms. Um, do you have any comment on, there's been a bit of media attention recently, uh, Farnham has famously uh, walked away from enterprise bargaining, um, amongst, for, uh, amongst other reasons, the criticism around its bank of hours approach. Uh, and they've recently in, uh, uh, entered into an agreement which includes terms as to things like a four day week or a nine day fortnight. Uh, is that something that you see as, as, as really coming from this changed approach to, to the burden? Do you believe there's going to be far more flexibility to look at uh, what I would describe as more imaginative arrangements in enterprise uh, Look, I, I think employers are particularly sensitive where uh, we've had workforces looking at more flexible arrangements, including such matters as working from home, one day, four nights, and so forth. I think employers are under more and more pressure to be able to provide flexibility under their arrangements. Uh, I don't know that the employee system has quite caught up to recognise that level of flexibility as yet. So anything you're providing under an enterprise agreement obviously needs to make the employee better off overall uh, on a global basis against the award. Uh, but I think it's something that employers are certainly looking towards achieving. These reforms may well assist uh, in terms of that. If you're looking at it from a sort of a global basis rather than line by line basis, that certainly seems to assist because you're looking at the workforce overall rather than individually. Ben, how long do you think it'll take the awards to catch up? Um, it, it doesn't seem to be a desire to, to change them and, and make them more flexible. I know going back a few years, there was a push for a small business award, which would have had greater flexibilities mm. in these areas. But um, there's certainly not uh, you know, a, a significant push from anyone to uh, change from the current system that we have. And it's largely a nine to five type system. So if you're doing work outside of those hours uh, or on the weekend, there's generally a penalty of rate that, that is going to apply. So there's not anyone to my knowledge who's, who's pushing for that system to, to change. And, and, and that is inconsistent somewhat to some of the flexibilities that, that workforce is seeking. Mm -hmm. So with our workforce, Ben, we don't have any agreements in place. We've purely worked, worked under the award system. So if we were to decide to, it might sound like a silly question, do nothing. Yep. And then we could get roped into the uh, multi-employer yep. agreement. Right? We could. Um, and we virtually have no say. Well, you, you can, so what would have to happen is that the, um, taking no action means that you then have a multi-employer agreement that gets set up in your industry. You have what might happen is the union might come knocking and they might make an application to seek to rope you into that yep. agreement. Uh, and if that was to occur, they have to satisfy the criteria. You can resist that application and there might be grounds to resist that application. But you can't stop the application itself no. from being dealt with by the commission. Um, and ultimately, the commission might decide it's appropriate to rope, rope you in, um, in which case you, you're stuck in, in that agreement. So, would that application have specifics like pay rates and all that sort of? Yeah, so um, the, the agreement itself, um, in terms of the content of these agreements, I, I've sort of described what I think the union might go in terms of these agreements initially. I don't know that there's going to be, you know, they're going to be significantly more than the award in terms of wage rates, but I'm thinking there's going to be other things, um, such as consultation with the unions and restrictions mm -hmm. on labour hire, those sort of things that you can tend to see in enterprise agreements that obviously aren't in the award. 
So they're the sort of things I'm thinking are going to then apply to your workplace if you're roped into uh, one of these multi-employer enterprise frameworks. Yeah. So Ben, did I hear you correctly that the CFMEU are excluded from? I, 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 sh I, I shouldn't have said that. That was me being flippant. <laughs> but uh, but the, uh, the, um, those employees who work in the building construction industry are. So um, uh, that is an industry that's been excluded from the multi employer bargaining. So, for those employers, me being one of them, yes. Um, we are already over the table, essentially. Um, CFMEU, who it, it would appear have been pushing their agreement on, on businesses for sure, some time. Sure. So how does that sort of collective agreement differ to what you presented today? Yeah, well, what 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 you what I think you're describing is that I mean, there's a well-known CFMEU, what we call PAC agreement. Yes. Uh, which they've always been forcing on but they must do that on an individual basis. Right. So they're not able to do that collectively like you are for a multi-employer agreement. I appreciate the pressure that the CFMEU put on employers in relation to that agreement. They don't really negotiate it. They simply give it to you and say, agree to this. Um, hold it young here. Uh, but that is actually done on an individual basis. And, and I guess that's the critical difference is that what the multi-employer agreement is about uh, is about an agreement that's going to be with the union on the one end and more than one employer on the other. Uh, I think initially, and then over time, what the union will no doubt look to do is to join as many union as many employers as they can over time, uh, and then I think you can have a significant industry-wide type enterprise agreement. Um, and this may well simply replace single enterprise agreements in those in those industries because it seems to me that um, it's a hell of a lot of time and resources for everybody to devote towards having three different levels that is awards single enterprise agreements and multi uh, agreements eventually one is going to replace the other you would think um, and the possibility it seems to me exists that these multi-employer agreements will simply replace enterprise agreements as we know them today Um, one of the concerns that's been raised about multi-employer agreements is the potential for commercially sensitive information to have to be disclosed and, and possibly made available to competitors in the same industry. Do you have any comment about that, Ben? Um, well, cer certainly in relation to if you're an employer seeking to resist such an application, um, you might do so on the basis that your operations and business activities are not reasonably comparable. And you might be looking at putting forward sensitive commercial information, business information as part of that process. Uh, I think though that having said that, there are confidentiality provisions that exist under the rules uh, at the Commission. And as an employer in that situation, you can apply for confidentiality orders um, much like we've done in relation to other matters where we've appeared on behalf of the employees of the Commission. So I don't really see that as a, as a legitimate concern that can't be dealt with by the Commission as part of those processes. Any other final questions? I have one, I think. So we have a zombie. A zombie agreement. Yeah. yeah. So I guess we're thinking we don't know whether to apply, continue it, or whether just to go to the. Sure, sure. We're a medical clinic, so. Yeah. We don't have to sure, sure. <laughs> um, well, you've got a few options. I, mean, I suspect the ability to extend these zombie agreements is going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine, I'm just guessing here, because they're obviously. We have a decision or anything like that. But um, I, I'm suspecting the Commission is going to be most reluctant to extend these zombie agreements unless there's something in there that's in advantage, such as uh, in 
partner's redundancy pay or something like that, then you as the employer can point to it and say, look, you know, there's a benefit that will be lost if the zombie agreement doesn't continue. Absent that situation, my expectation is people should be looking to terminate these arrangements yeah. and won't, won't extend past the, past the sunset date. Mm -hmm. So, in that situation, you need to look at is it going to be the award? Do we want to negotiate a new agreement or whatever? So, yeah. I imagine that they're going to be the main option. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, with June coming up, you'll need to make a decision about what you're communicating to the workforce mm -hmm. about what you're intending to do moving yeah. forward, because it seems to me there's some statutory information you need to provide to the workforce, but really they're going to want to know what are you doing? Mm -hmm. uh, because maybe with that, they might be concerned about falling back to the is that that's probably not reflected in the agreement though. It's a zombie agreement. Just in the eye. My child's being a shot. Especially when we meet us been there for a long time. <laughs> sure. No. sure. Mm. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming and uh, welcome to the Brave World.